Today, uh, we have a great visitor with us. Uh, his name is Josh Daniels. Josh and I were uh, at BYU at the same time. Um, and uh, Josh has done a lot of things between BYU and now. And I, I will let him talk about all the various uh, different exciting things he's done. Um, you, you have some military experience as well, and that was you did that here at BYU, right? Okay, so that so definitely um, you want to hear about that as well. Um, interesting stuff in uh, kind of nonprofits um, or kind of government, uh, kind of government adjacent type work, and then working directly in uh, elected office as well. So I think we're gonna that that'll be interesting to hear kind of all of those different perspectives. Um, so. He's going to talk for a little bit and then have some, you know, please have some good questions and, uh, and comments afterward. We'll have a good discussion. Um, and so I will, I will turn it over to Josh and um, I will step away from the microphone. Thank you. So for the, uh, <clears throat> I know somebody was video recording this. Does the camera move automatically or no? Okay, so you'd like me to stay put probably. Okay, I can do that. Um, so let me first start by inviting all of you to go get one or to, to, to each get those three handouts that are over there. Sure, yeah, that'd be fine. So it's three, three different handouts, two of them I'll refer to. One of them is, uh, I'll do the little advertisement up front. Um, it is a series of jobs that we have in our office at Utah County Government, right downtown Provo, where you can come work with us in our office part-time, and we will pay you for that. Uh, there's a variety of cool roles, so there's some, some cool flexibility, things like being a poll worker. That's, you know, when there's an election on election day, come make 200 bucks. That's pretty easy. Pass, go, collect $200, the whole nine yards. Um, other ones are come into our office on a day daily basis or a couple times a week, five to 10 hours a week. We have shift work for customer service where it's like 15 hours a week. Um, a lot of cool jobs. One of the all-star students of BYU political science, one of Mike's, uh, Professor Barber, we were classmates. He was a great student a great classmate, and uh, I'm sure he's a great professor. One of his TAs was one of our all-star rock star election workers who did some cool data analysis to try to look for voter fraud. So anyways, a lot of cool opportunities. So let me start with the top 10 things I didn't think I would have done 15 years ago when I literally, literally was sitting exactly where you're sitting actually on these very chairs they haven't uh, changed they haven't been surplused yet when they are i'm sure the county will buy them because we're very cheap um, but literally was sitting right where you are the paneling hasn't changed the pictures haven't changed um, but 15 years later um, i would not have thought that i was going to be here so here's the top 10 things so the first is i didn't think i would be here speaking to you 15 years ago um, I didn't think that I would be invited to speak by one of my classmates who was probably sitting next to me in this room 15 years ago, um, who's now an awesome professor at, uh, at BYU. Maybe you'll be an awesome professor at BYU in 15 years. I didn't think that one of my classmates who would have been sitting right here next to me would have quoted me in her New York Times bestselling book in an unflattering way. Um, I didn't think that would happen, and fortunately, my name is very generic, Josh, so when she quotes me by name, nobody thinks it's actually my name, so nobody really knows that I was quoted in the book, but I was. Um, I didn't think that my work would be featured in the New York Times, which it was, and I shared all with all of you an article. I didn't think that that work that was featured in the New York Times that I would have been involved in would form the basis of a giant federal lawsuit working its way through the Israeli court system. I did not think that I would be the subject of an Israeli court case. Um, I did not think that I would have been a key person to legalize marijuana in Utah. I just would not have predicted that 15 years ago, and, but I was. I was very involved, and I'll talk about that in the medical cannabis initiative in Utah. I did not think that I would have spent an entire workday chauffeuring the last human being to set foot on the moon in my Honda Civic. That, I did not think that would happen, but, but it did, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. That's Gene Cernan, Eugene Cernan, astronaut. And I did not think that I would be the elected 
county clerk of Utah County. And I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. So um, I, I kind of say that humorously to open your mind to your future, which you cannot predict. I'm here to tell you, you can't predict your future. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, I, I hope that you think about. One of them is that there is something that you think today and that you feel very strongly about that 15 years from now, you will have had a 180 degree turn on that thing. So just keep that in mind when you're, you know, doing your life and you're talking to people and you're working on things. Um, allow for the possibility that 15 years from now, you'll look back and be like, I have a 180 degree turn on, on that idea, on that issue, on that thought, whatever that is. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, when I was a freshman at BYU in the year 2000, uh, it was very in, a very interesting time because uh, you might remember the great election of the year 2000. Bush v. Gore came down to a recount in Florida. I remember working. Uh, I was like a I had like a part time job as the janitor in the dorms, and I'm like vacuuming the carpets and like glued to the television watching the uh, the recount. And uh, that was quite a saga. I didn't know then that I would be involved in administering elections, you know, 22 years later. Um, but I but I am. So but back then in the year 2000, um, I fancied myself a variety of ambitions, things that I was going to do with my life. You know, among them was be a political science major, somehow change the world. Uh, maybe I have in some small way. Um, but uh, I decided that one of the things I was going to do is I was going to join the military. So unbeknownst to my parents, who were a few states away in Kansas, I went on down to the Provo Marine Corps recruiting office as a freshman at BYU and said, I'd like to enlist in the Marines. Uh, and so that's what I did. And um, I was still a student. I don't, don't, don't be alarmed. I joined the reserves. And this was during peacetime. You see, we had not been at war as a nation for nearly 10 years. And so it was very safe to go ahead and join the Marines and be a college student and just go, you know, tinker around with the, the guns on the weekend and get some extra money for college. I assured my parents that I would never be sent to war. Uh, they were absurd for thinking that there would ever be a war in the future. We were very much at peace uh, as a nation. Um, so after my freshman year at BYU, part of my commitment was to go full-time to the boot camp and do all the training, go to the infantry school, all that kind of stuff. I decided to squeeze that in before my mission. I thought that might help me be a better missionary maybe, I don't know. So, so I went ahead and I did the boot camp thing right after my freshman year at BYU. And uh, later that year, so you know, boot camp was that summer of, in this case, 2001. And so come fall of 2001, I was in infantry school. And it was the last week of infantry school. We were having our final exams, very different than the final exams you probably have experienced here. Um, instead of facts about France, it was facts about machine guns. So it's the same thing, just facts. You just memorize them. So, you know, what is the effective distance of a machine gun on the human body? You know, it's very similar to like political processes in Europe. So, you know, just 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 information. Um, so I wake up the last week of infantry school and our instructors are freaking out because it's uh, like when Tuesday or Wednesday, September the 11th of 2001. And they're telling us about how the nation is being attacked. And so we're all like freaking out. And they're like, yeah, you guys are going to like go to war like next week. And they were wrong. We, it was a few more weeks than that. Um, but shortly after I joined the Marines, I, I was completely a hypocrite to my parents uh, and, uh, you know, uh, was completely wrong. So we did end up at, at war for like 10 years. And so, uh, so I finished my training and then I went on my mission to Boston and our ward mission leader was Mitt Romney's campaign manager. And I thought, oh, I want to help. I was a college Republican. So I tried to get the whole zone to register to vote. Turns out that 19 year olds, whether they're on a mission or they're at college, have an equal amount of interest in politics, which is zero. So nobody in the zone registered to vote except for me. But uh, I got to go and vote and, and watch the, uh, you know, from a, from a distance, the gubernatorial administration of Mitt Romney in Massachusetts on my mission. That was kind of interesting. Saw some interesting things that, that they did in Massachusetts government at that time. Lots of innovative 
of things. One of them was health care reform, which the federal government uh, copied the, pro the program for the whole country. That was interesting. But then I came back to BYU after my mission, and I did my weekends in the military and just didn't know if I'd be called up. Um, the unit that I was a part of had been called up for the initial invasion, but I had just barely escaped because I had uh, gone on my mission, and so I was kind of in an inactive status at the time, so I didn't have to, to go. But I spent my, my days here listening to lots of great speakers, and during our senior year of college, um, I got the notice that they were going to surge troops in Iraq. They were basically going to send a lot more troops to put down the Sunni insurgency in the Anbar province, the western part of Iraq. So I found myself with a job, which was great news because, you know, graduate from BYU and you have a job right afterwards. And my job was to go to war full time uh, in Iraq. So it was kind of a cool like internship kind of right. Like between undergrad and graduate school, you like go to war. It's a it's a kind of it's a resume builder. So, um, so that's what I did. Fortunately, I survived, came home. I shouldn't joke about that because a lot of people didn't survive. But, but generally speaking, uh, if you look at like death rates in the Iraq war, they're actually pretty low. I mean, it's unfortunate people died. War is not a good thing. Uh, you know, I used to be all about war. I'm not very much about war. It's one of my 180 degree turns. I don't think war is a good idea. Um, maybe it takes going to war to kind of realize that. Um, but, you know, I could tell you lots of interesting stories about that uh, if, if you have questions. But I came home and uh, returned to my wife, who was uh, about to give birth to our first child. So we had, you know, timed it just right that during our vacation, right before we flew into Iraq, we had a week off. And we were very successful that week so that uh, when I came home, we could begin our family right away. Um, so... But, you know, that, that didn't go so well. She had some health problems while I was in Iraq, and I didn't even know about it because I'm out in the middle of nowhere and freaking out. So uh, that was an interesting time. But came back in 2008, uh, just in time for a really hot political season. So I joined multiple political campaigns uh, in a variety of roles from volunteer to staff. And, uh, and did a lot of political stuff. I was always very politically involved. I was the chairman of the college Republicans at BYU. I was involved in the state group of college Republicans and um, just really liked to be involved in campaigns and elections and things like that. So, so that's what I started to do for, for work when I got back from Iraq. And then uh, my plan was always to go to graduate school. So I went to law school, went to Houston, uh, University of Houston, go Cougars. They're going to be our new rivals in the Big 12. Two Cougars in one Big 12. That's going to be uh, interesting. I've uh, been to many games between BYU and Houston. Uh, BYU has always won those games, and hopefully that will continue in the Big 12. Um, but the, the University of Houston, so while I was at BYU, I ran into Quinn Monson in the hall, and he said, this, ba this is back when students like Mike and I didn't have to take 328. You could major in political science and not take 328. Can you imagine how cool that would be? Um, it was really cool because I was not going to take 328. I mean, are you kidding me? There's a reason I'm a political science major, and part of it is not taking statistics. Um, but he told me, he's like, Josh, you're kind of this political guy. You want to be on campaigns. Campaigns are all about data. And I'm like, no, they're not. They're all about messaging. Nope, they're all about data. I'm like, you sure about this? Yes, I'm sure about this. I teach a class in public polling. You should take that too. So that's what I did. I took those classes and, and I took 328 on his advice. And I got an A. I thought I was going to fail that class, but I worked my tail off. And, and maybe some of you have had that fate or a worse fate. I don't know. But um, it depends on your teacher and how good they are. But I'm really glad that I studied quantitative uh, material while in undergrad because it helped me settle on the right law school to go to. You see, I created a giant spreadsheet that uh, weighed all of these different factors about law schools to settle on the optimal law school that was the best value, and it was University of Houston. And in fact, it was their night program, so I could have a full-time job and go to school for four years instead of three at night. So that's what I did. And so we moved to Houston, and uh, I got right back into campaigns, and I went to work as a full-time staffer for a congressman. 
and worked on his campaign in 2010 and 2012. And he was on the Science and Technology Committee in uh, Congress. And our district included the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And so one time we did this cool political junket where we went around to all these elementary schools uh, with a real life astronaut and we did these like STEM days. And so that's how I got to go drive Eugene Cernan, the last man on the moon, all around the Houston area to elementary schools and, um, and you know, talk to kids about science, technology, engineering, and math. And that was a really cool experience. And while he was in the car, I, I asked him, I said, did you actually visit the moon? Because, you know, I've heard there's this idea that maybe we never went there. He confirmed that he, in fact, went to the moon. So I believe him. I'm pretty sure he went to the moon. Um, but that was really cool. Cool experience, right? And I've got lots of other cool little political experiences like that. But so I worked for this congressman full time, went to school part time. Um, that worked out pretty good. I continued to be involved in political stuff and and worked on campaigns and um, uh, and, and just learned a whole lot and cut my teeth in, in a variety of ways. And then when I graduated, I liked public policy so much, I got a job. I came back here to Utah and I got a job as the policy director for uh, like a small, it was very small at the time, kind of a startup think tank called the Libertas Institute, libertarian with a small L. Um, I've always considered myself politically what you might call in the ideological spectrum a classical liberal. Raise your hand if like you've heard that term and you know what it means. Oh, yeah, you're my people. Nobody in my world knows what that term means, but I'm a classical liberal. So I really loved working with the Libertas Institute. And we were very successful in lobbying the state legislature on a variety of cool things. And I found myself literally changing Utah law on like a five minute notice. Like, hey, we should really take this language out of the law. It's really bad. Okay, let's go talk to this legislator and convince him. Oh, he's convinced. Great. The amendment's in. Hey, by the end of the week, Utah law's changed. That's pretty cool. So um, that's actually a credit to how the Utah legislative process works. It's actually very fast. Oftentimes in the country, legislative processes are very slow. You can think of the most notable example in Washington, D.C. Uh, but other states, California is very slow, but Utah is very fast. Um, as we speak, the law is being changed, actually. So um, that was really cool. Great experience that I had and did that for a couple of years. Um, one of the things that that we had as a plan back in 2014 was that within two to four years, we were going to have medical marijuana legal in Utah. And so we laid out this whole plan and we followed it exactly. And it worked like it actually worked. The, the actual plan we put together worked. We started with uh, medical CBD oil and we got a whole bunch of moms with kids that had seizures. And that was a hit with the legislature and they changed the law like that. And then we had a really cool bill for medical marijuana more broadly, and that failed. That was like uh, it went down with a thud. And so we had to really organize the community for a year and then come back to the legislature and try it again. And we got to the very last day of the legislature, and literally the bill died by one vote in the final committee. But, I mean, it was awesome. We got, we got so close. And so we threatened the legislature because, you know, why not? Just a couple of 30-year-old guys that want to change the world. So we told the legislature, if you don't pass this bill, we're going to get an initiative. And that initiative is going to pass. And one of your friends is probably going to lose their congressional seat over it, like Mia Love. And that's exactly what happened. So we went out and we raised a couple million dollars. And we went toe-to-toe with an organization I love that owns this university. Um, they lost, we won, so we got the initiative passed. And actually, it wasn't very uh, tense, it wasn't like a big battle. We actually compromised. And that's another thing that I, I wanna talk to you about at some point is the importance of compromise. This is a principle that you should learn because if you wanna get something done in life, no matter what you do, compromise is super important, right? And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but I just wanna finish this cool story about medical cannabis. So, um, so there we were at the last minute, and this is like the behind the scenes stuff, so like don't share this too broadly. But what happened was we had all this public opinion polling, thank you, uh, Quinn Monson, for teaching us about this, um, and it showed that the public liked medical cannabis. And we were out of money. We had all the signatures. We were about to go into the election cycle with this initiative on the ballot. 
And most people in the community thought that the public was for medical cannabis, which is which was true. They were. What they didn't know was that we had done some workshops and done some focus groups and some specialized polling to say, well, what if the LDS church were to oppose it and say this or to say this or to say this? And all of a sudden, support evaporated. And we were like, oh, crap. Uh, if, if this becomes a big public battle and the church is very much against it and they were kind of just kind of quiet about it, then uh, we're going to lose. And we're out of money. And we know that they have money, not the entity, but allies of that position had $10 million ready to spend. Um, but here's the grand um, lesson of political negotiation or of all negotiation. The person who wins the negotiation is the one who knows the strength and weakness of their own position and the strength and weakness of their opponent's position. If you have that information, then you are going to be more successful in a negotiation. Something that, that the other side didn't know was how strong their hand was and how weak our hand was. They didn't know we were out of money. They thought we had limitless supplies of money from out of state. That wasn't true. All of our money actually came from Utah. Um, so we knew how weak our position was, and we knew that if we didn't negotiate and compromise and get the legislature to come into a special session and to adopt this medical cannabis bill in a watered-down version, then our opposition would likely be better funded than us and their messaging would be more impactful on voters, and we'd probably lose at the ballot. And so we weren't going to gamble on that. And so we compromised with the legislature, and it was awesome, and actually built some really strong relationships of trust with policymakers and key stakeholders in the legislature and in the governor's office who thought that we were just wacky libertarians, completely unreasonable and hard to work with. Well, that wasn't true. Um, we had some very strategic gives that we had already pre-planned in the language of our initiative. We knew that there were things that didn't matter that much that we could sacrifice and maybe even get later, um, but that could look like a compromise. And so we literally played the plan perfectly. We got basically everything we wanted. Everybody got to save face. Nobody came out bruised and broken. Everybody won. And, and then the, the opposition evaporated, and then the initiative still passed on the ballot because there was no opposition to change voter opinion. And, um, and we didn't care because, you know, the law that would be effective was the one that was passed in the special session, which was kind of the, the compromise. And it was just really awesome to be a part of that and to change the law in a way that I think helps a lot of sick people who can use uh, medical cannabis products. One of the funny things about this, though, was that we had this goofy little provision where we knew that people in the state had this desire to regulate stuff. And we're like, look, if we're going to allow people to grow cannabis in Utah, the, the legislators are not going to go for a program that doesn't have oversight. So we need to have like a oversight board that will be in charge of giving out licenses to grow cannabis. And who's going to be on this licensing board? So literally, we were like in a little office, like coming up with this stuff. And we're like, well, I don't know. Um, the legislature will go for like somebody from law enforcement and like maybe like an academic professor who specializes in chemistry and maybe like somebody who represents patients and then maybe like a member of the public and and it'll be the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food that'll oversee it because, you know, it's agriculture and also they're much easier to work with. So it's sort of funny that today I'm actually one of the board members on this board that I helped create that, you know, just arbitrarily we put that into Utah law. And the other day I was at the board meeting and some of the other board members were like, well, I don't know why, you know, this kind of a person is on the board. I, I don't know who, who decided that, but that's kind of interesting. You know, I'm just sitting over there like, if only you knew. It just kind of fell out of our brain as a, as a tactic or a strategy that we thought would, would sell with policymakers, which is a lesson, right? Um, you got to understand the psychology of decision makers if you would like to influence their decision. And it's not rocket science. It's just understanding what makes them tick, understanding what's important to them, understanding what their values are, what kinds of things they'll they'll agree to, what kinds of things they they prefer, and then just cater to that, right? I mean, it's almost like campaigning 101. So that was that was kind of interesting. It's interesting to be here, you know, six years later as a part of this arbitrary board that we just thought up on a whim. Um, so that's that's kind of a fun thing. So um, then after medical cannabis was passed, I got a job working as a government relations 
uh, officer at a at a textbook company, Pearson. It's a it's a education company. Some of your textbooks are probably published by Pearson. They had a charter school company for online charter school, so that kids can go to school at home, which is an interesting idea. I don't know why that would be useful, but uh, but lots of kids liked it. So um, I would work on these virtual schools and work in the legislatures of about 10 different states in the Western US. And that was a lot of fun because I would go and see how the legislative process works in Nevada or how it works in California or Oregon or Washington or Montana or Wyoming. And it's a little bit different everywhere and it's a lot of fun. If you, if you like public policy, um, visiting other state capitals and getting involved in the legislative process in other states is a lot of fun. And, and that's so I did that for a couple of years. And then I had this friend of mine here in Utah who uh, decided she wanted to run for the county clerk position. And I kind of laughed at her. I'm like, yeah, that's that's not a very glorious job, but good luck with that. And she won. She beat a 12 year incumbent totally by surprise. And so after she won, she called me up and said, I would like you to come be my chief deputy. And I, I literally laughed at her on the phone. Uh, she's like, I would like you to come work for me in the county clerk's office. And I just audibly laughed. Like, it was just my natural reaction. I was like, why would I want to work for the county clerk? That does not sound interesting. I've worked for a member of Congress. I'm the regional government affairs person for this uh, international company. Like, why would I come work for you? Um, so she twisted my arm and called me over and over and over again until I said yes. And uh, she shared her idea about, you know, innovation and disruption. And I was like, okay. I was like, all right. Maybe I owe it to my community to step forward and actually do something to, to, to give back and enter public service. So I decided to go ahead and do that. So I came on as the chief deputy clerk auditor, which is a mouthful. It, it, it's like super nerd, right? It's like chief deputy clerk auditor. It's like, okay, I didn't think that was going to be my title. Came in in 2019, and it was the coolest thing ever because all of a sudden you realize some of the things that local government does – is basically just the whim of the elected official. And if you change the elected official, you might change everything about how that office operates. And we inherited an office that the governor of Utah had called in the 2018 election. So this is the 2018 election um, where uh, actually um, Mia Love lost in 2018 because turnout among Republicans in Utah County was so low because the polling uh, place lines were six hours. So at the rec center here in Provo, if you had voted in the general election in November in 2018, you could have watched the movie The Titanic twice before you voted. Um, it was kind of like two different versions of the Titanic, the one that is the sinking ship of the election and then the one that you're watching on your laptop which you'd have run out of battery, but um, it, was a, it was a disaster. And it was a disaster because the local officials who were in charge of the clerk's office made some really bad decisions because they were bad decision makers and they were bad leaders and they didn't make data-driven decisions. And that's another principle I wanna talk about. And I'm gonna get to that in a second. But one of your handouts is my attempt at channeling my inner Quinn Monson and my skills of 328 to use data to help make better decisions in local government. One of the decisions that they made that led to the six-hour lines was they failed to appreciate the amount of time it would take a voter to vote a really long ballot that included a lot of initiatives, including a medical cannabis initiative. Um, and so, and they also failed to realize that that was going to draw more people to the polls, which it did. I don't know whose fault that was. That guy should be flogged. Um, but it was a disastrous election because they failed to plan and they failed to collect data and use data to inform their operational plan. And they had too few machines, too few locations, too many voters, and a ballot that took so long to vote. And everybody had to vote on a touchscreen machine, which created a huge uh, you know, choke point. And, um, and some of the staff had actually timed how long it would take an average voter to vote, it's kind of in a sample, before, long before the election. And they came to the leadership and they said, we don't have enough machines. We're estimating X amount of voters to maybe vote on election day. And if it takes a X amount of time, then we're going to need X amount of machines or we're going to have lines that are like three hours or longer. And they're like, eh, there's nothing we can do. This is all the machines we have. So some problems, some big problems, right? So when I came into the office as the chief deputy clerk auditor in 2019, we changed 
everything. We threw out the old election system. We got a new election system. Um, we couldn't throw out the staff because, you know, they have like protected jobs. So we had to retrain them and we had to ignite their uh, their passions and we had to get them riled up and excited and and give them a vision and change the culture. And so that's what we did. I just took some of the Marine Corps leadership that I had learned and experienced and we changed the culture of that office from people who would watch Netflix while they processed voter registration forms to people who woke up in the morning excited to innovate and make something better when it came to elections. So in 2018, after the six hour lines, Governor Gary Herbert, a former Utah County Commissioner and a former Lieutenant Governor, which means he's over elections for the state of Utah, he called Utah County Elections Office the epicenter of dysfunction. Literally, the Deseret News said, what do you think about the long lines in Utah County? And he said, well, when it comes to elections, it seems like Utah County is the epicenter of dysfunction. And we took epicenter of dysfunction and we used it as the messaging to go to the legislature and ask for millions of dollars to help us get all new equipment. And they gave it to us. Again, that was because of relationships. Um, relationships are important in your career. Uh, don't ever burn a bridge. Relationships are really critical. But because of those relationships and some of our vision and re, you know, retooling the vision and, and uh, culture of the office, we went from literally the worst election office in the state to one of the best, I think. One that has won many awards. Um, one of the cool things that we did so, you know, my, my friend and former boss, she's now a county commissioner. Her name's Amelia Powers Gardner. And I'm now, you know, I had to backfill her job because she twisted my arm and I came in to work for her and then she abandoned me and then I had to run in a special election to replace her. And so here I am now the elected county clerk auditor, which is still a mouthful, but it won't be next year because Utah County is going to split those offices. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but here we were uh, innovating everything. Well, my boss, before she even became the county clerk, she had already won the election. She'd won the Republican primary. In fact, she'd even won the general election. She was the heir apparent, but she had no business in the office until like January 7th. So she comes into the office because she'd recently gotten remarried and or was going to recently get remarried. So she comes in at 440 on a Friday, which is the worst time to go to a government office except for at our office now. I'll get to that in a second. I keep saying that. I'll get to that in a second. It's like keeping you, just keeping you. But um, she goes in at 440 and the door's locked. And the little old ladies that issue the marriage licenses are in the office, but the door's locked. And she's like knocking and they come and they open. Can I help you? She's like, yeah, I'm here to get my marriage license. Do you guys, you guys close at four? Like, well, no, we close at five. Well, well, the door was locked. Yeah, yeah, about that. So anyway, she comes in. And she fills out the form for her marriage license in 2019 with a pen and a clipboard and a piece of paper, right? So she, she writes down her name and all that on the paper. And she gives the paper to the, the lady. And then the lady takes it and puts it on the, the little thing and then types it. And she's over here like, are you, are you, are you serious right now? Is this, this is how we do this in 2019. We lock the door at 440. You write on a piece of paper and then somebody else types it. And then they print the typed version and they hand it to you and they say, is that correct? And you're like, yep, that's correct. And then it's like, okay, five minutes later, here's your marriage license. Take it, go get yourself married, have it returned to the office. Here's an envelope. And she's just like, this has got to change. So that was one of my first marching orders. We come in the office and she's like, Josh, this has got to change. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I got you. I just came from virtual school. I never touched a piece of paper. Everything was digital. Um, so... In that year, we decided to go completely online. You can apply, you can pay online. It's really important that you're not under age and that you are who you say you are. So we have to validate your identity online. So we integrated with an identity check system to where your identity is, is verified online. You use your smartphone, you take a picture of your face and of your license. We have some really cool technology that integrates all that. And then your license is automatically issued to you. You get an email with a special link that you can give to the temple or to whomever performs your wedding. They click the link, they say, yes, you are getting married click and then you automatically have a finalized certificate when you only marry. Certificate is registered on the Ethereum blockchain, which creates a digital certification saying that that is an authentic digital document from Utah County. So we did this end to end digital process. Come to find out we are the first people in the entire world in the history of humanity to do that. So that was kind of cool. 
So then we get this call from Governing Technology Magazine, and they're like, hey, we heard about what you're doing with this marriage license. We'd like to recognize you as one of the 25. I'm like, that's cool. We're going to be in the top five. So we crack open the top 25. We look at the last year. There's Mayor Pete Buttigieg, one of the top 25, you know, because he was a mayor. I was like, this is cool. We're in the same, we're in the same magazine as Pete Buttigieg. So we got recognized for having this totally digital marriage licensing system. That was not enough for me. I was like, why do you even have to get married in person at all? So I'm like, we're going to start marrying people on Zoom. So the pandemic hit, which gave us the perfect excuse to say, well, people can't come into the office, so we're just going to have Zoom weddings. Um, so, okay, so where's the wedding happening, Josh? Well, state law says the wedding has to happen in Utah. So if the officiator's in Utah, then the wedding's happening in Utah. So I don't care where the couples are. So we start doing weddings on Zoom. And all of a sudden, people in one country and another country are now coming to Utah County virtually through Zoom and getting married. Well, the country of Israel did not like this, and they stopped recognizing our marriages in violation of international treaties, mind you, which created a lawsuit that we just won a few weeks ago. And so the Israeli court told the ministry that recognizes marriages that they have 30 days to rethink their decision, which basically means you need to recognize the marriages or we're going to embarrass you with an order forcing you to do so. So now we're the first ones in the world where you can get married completely online right here in Utah County. And that's the, that's the, the nature of that New York Times article. So that taught me that if you can dream it, you can do it. Because I remember the first day we came into office, I told the guy over the marriages, we should just do this whole thing online. He's like, that's crazy, Josh. That'll never happen. Well, here we are a few years later. It's exactly what we're doing. And it's awesome. It's glorious. And if you would like to marry people on Zoom, you can come work for us. And you, too, can marry people famous people that I can't even tell you about. In fact, one of our weddings that a BYU student was officiating on a Saturday morning, oh, by the way, we changed our hours. We're now open from 8 a.m. to 7.30 a.m., and we're open on Saturday. So one of these young ladies who's a BYU student who is performing the wedding, you have to have two witnesses. So one of the witnesses, it was blank on the screen. She's like, okay, are you guys ready for the wedding? Yeah, we're ready. Okay, where's your witnesses? You've got one witness, but where's the other witness? Oh, that's our friend Meredith. She's, she's running a few minutes late. Okay, we'll wait for her. A few minutes later, into the Zoom picture comes Paris Hilton. No lie, Paris Hilton. So we've had actually some, some interesting and famous people all around the world get married in our system. So um, let me tell you about the data-driven decision, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about local government, which is where I'm at now and what, what I do now, and then we'll have some questions. So the other cool achievement, aside from changing everything with elections, being featured in the New York Times, being the first in human history and on planet Earth to do some cool stuff, um, we now have a cool system where you can vote on your phone. Uh, we use a special app and some blockchain check. Uh, blockchain technology where if you're overseas or something like that, you can have your ballot delivered to your smartphone and you can vote digitally and return it to our office. That's really cool. We're one of the first to do that. Um, we're the, we were the first in Utah to do ranked choice voting for cities. And we've been very involved in ranked choice voting innovation in Utah County, much to the chagrin of other county clerks in the state, which is always fun to get in fights with other elected officials. Um, <clears throat> but the other cool accomplishment that I don't publicly talk about except for to you all, is as a classical liberal, I like to credit myself with being the person who successfully orchestrated a property tax increase for the first time in 30 years in Utah County. So if you're a Republican, maybe you hate me. I'm a Republican. Don't, don't hate me. But it's all about data-driven decision-making. You see, we came into office. We had to go beg the legislature for money for our elections. Why? Well, because we didn't have enough money. Well, why not? I mean, you can tax as much as you want. It's up to the county. But see, political decision making isn't really about what makes sense, it's about what will sell to voters. And that's kind of a fundamental problem, right? And so the only way to combat that effectively, in my opinion, is with data. And so I said to myself, what's the right amount of money for Utah County to collect in taxes? How could I arrive at the answer to this question? What's the right amount? And so I conjured up my 328 and all the things I learned at BYU and uh, my economics classes, which I took a few of those, and you should too if you get the chance. So I put together these charts for our county commissioners. And um, basically I said, look, if we were to fix the size of government on a per capita basis back 
30 years ago when the property tax law was last changed. Um, and we were to only adjust for inflation and population from 30 years ago to today and keep a relatively constant economic cost of government, so per capita inflation adjusted. I mean, you know, if you're really an economist, you might tell me there's some other things I should adjust for. But population and, and inflation are the two big ones. How much money would we be collecting in property taxes today? And in fact, how much would we have collected over the recent past by failing to adjust our tax rate to adjust for inflation? Because in Utah, property tax rates naturally decline as property values go up because uh, the way the property tax law works is it fixes in nominal dollars the amount of tax revenue for local government unless local government chooses to, quote unquote, increase it. So in other words, it's not a set rate. And as your house goes up in value, you get more money. No, no, no. The rate actually will go down as your house goes up in value. And uh, there's some complicated formulas that play into this. But the point is, because of a lack of political vision, political will, and data-driven decision-making, the county commission for the last 30 years in an act of political cowardice has failed to adjust the property tax rate appropriately to capture what I think would be maybe the right amount of revenue to fund local services. How could I visualize this? So I put together these charts. And one of them shows um, kind of how much money over time the county missed out on a new administration building and the cost of the administration building uh, the, the, the cost of this administration building was equal exactly almost to the amount of money they had failed to collect by not adjusting their property tax rate over time and I could show that vision um, literally, Josh Daniels, data collector extraordinaire, spent late nights typing up our finance statements into a big spreadsheet so that I could create this, this data chart. But I, I made a, a key flaw. I presented this chart to a county commissioner, one of the decision makers, and I thought that this chart, especially because the color, red and green, really helped show the contrast of, of you know, the revenue and kind of this deficit of collection. Come to find out that county commissioner is colorblind. Red and green don't, don't work for colorblind people. I mean, you know, classic mistake. Don't do that. If you're ever presenting complex data to a key political decision maker, make sure they're not colorblind before you show red and, red and green, right? But, um, but I definitely leveraged a lot of my analytical skills that are data oriented from the things I learned right here at BYU um, in, in doing that project. And, and for the first time in 30 years, we were able to persuade the county commission to actually raise the property tax rate. And it's made a big difference in our fiscal climate. We were running a deficit, what we call a structural deficit, in Utah County for four of the five previous years to coming into office. So we came into a giant mess, a mess in elections, a mess in basic public services, a mess in the finances. So let me tell you a little bit about county government, because you might wonder, well, you're the county clerk, you're over elections, why are you over finances? So the county clerk and auditor are two different roles under state law. Auditor is basically like the chief finance officer of the county, and clerk is like the clerk of the county. So you keep the records, we have this warehouse where you can go see really cool books from 100 years ago. Um, and, uh, and then we oversee elections and public services like marriage licenses and we'll issue passports and that kind of thing. So a little bit about county government, just kind of the details if you're, if you're really a nerd about how local government in Utah is structured. Um, a county, just like a city, is a political subdivision of the state, meaning they're created by the state. They don't have their own independent political authority. It's not like they're sovereign. They're created by the state and they carry out state administrative functions at a local level. And there are like 11 different independently elected officials that oversee county government operations. You have a board of three county commissioners, depending on your form of government. You might have a mayor and a council like Salt Lake County has. But in Utah County, we have three independently elected county commissioners who share legislative and executive power. Um, they vote on ordinances, but then they also execute contracts and oversee operations. But then you have other independently elected officials, a sheriff, an attorney, an assessor, a recorder, a treasurer, a surveyor 
a clerk auditor. And so sometimes we might all fight in like a, th- we have this like r- arena with like fences and we just get in there and that's how we figure out all of, all of our dis- differences. It certainly feels like that sometimes. Um, in our office, the clerk auditor's office, we have these two separate statutory functions, the financial functions and these other, you know, clerk functions, which is where elections resides. We have about 40 people full time, another 20 people part time. And in any given election year, a couple hundred poll workers, hopefully some of you will will join those ranks. Um, and uh, as a county, we go through about a half a billion dollars a year. Most of that is passed through money for transportation projects and some other functions like the health department and things like that. When you look at our general fund, it's about $110 million. And about 85% of that is spent on uh, basically the justice system between the prosecution of crimes, the county attorney's office, which prosecutes all crimes in the state within Utah County. Uh, Rarely will you get prosecuted by somebody at the Attorney General's office. That would be for much more complicated state crimes. But otherwise, most crimes are prosecuted locally at the district court by the county prosecutor, which is the county attorney. And then you might end up in the county jail, which is about $70 million a year to staff and run the county jail, which is where folks go if they're going to be behind bars for a year or less, which is the vast majority of anybody that gets put behind bars. It's a little bit rare to get put in state prison. Um, so your chances chances are good. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, I hope that was fun and not too much of a rant and that I was able to, to share some things. I'm going to open myself up for questions, but let me lay down a few more laws and rules for life if you didn't already take enough notes. Number one, networking. Uh, who you know is super important. Relationships are key. They all lead to jobs and opportunities uh, to make a difference. Uh, I, in my life, many of my jobs have come because of who you know, like when my friend called me and twisted my arm and made me into this job. Never burn a bridge. This is super important. There's many times in this business where you're going to end back up in the same place. So like, it's a good thing I never said anything really mean to Mike when we were students because then he was willing to invite me back, right? Um, you never know what's going to happen. Treat job interviews like networking. I've actually gotten jobs, not from the interview that I was interviewing for, but they were like, hey, you're really good for blah, 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 blah. You should go talk to so-and-so. And And then you end up with that job. So job interviews are networking. So don't not apply for a job because you don't think you're going to get it. I once applied for a job I was totally overqualified for simply to network with with the people there. And it worked out really well. Uh, A rule that I've learned in county government, vacuums get filled. What does this mean? Well, if somebody is neglecting their duty or somebody is neglecting to lead, they are creating a vacuum. If you're proactive and talented, you can fill that vacuum. And we've done that in county government where uh, vacuums of leadership and vacuums of of problem solving, we have stepped in and filled them and uh, had opportunities to, to make a difference. So be a problem solver, fill vacuums, meet people where they are. Um, You know, I used to go through life arrogantly thinking everybody had to meet me where I'm at. You don't accomplish much that way. You need to meet people where they are. So you need to observe and learn about people, what makes them tick, what motivates them, and then meet them where they're at. This this comes into compromise. Compromise is super, super important. Um, And then here's like three more spiritual and moral ideas. Fear and love are the only two motivators in humanity. Everything that motivates human behavior is based in either fear or based in love. And leadership is about managing fear. In your life and in your career, you will notice a series of dysfunctional behaviors, both for yourself and for those around you. Every dysfunctional behavior is a function of fear. If you can identify and understand the fears that are motivating or really menacing other people, and you can help to manage their fear, you can remove the dysfunction. Never stop learning and improving yourself. You're you're your greatest asset. Continue to invest in yourself. And then the last one is happiness is a choice. It's better to be happy than rich. It's better to be happy than alone. Um, Life is so much better when you're happy, but happiness is a choice, so you should proactively choose to be happy. Do the things in life that will bring you happiness. Um, Sometimes the rat race is not one of those things, so uh, beware that the rat race isn't always a pathway to happiness. It's always a lot better to just be be happy, so, so be happy. And that's what I have to share with you, and I'd love to answer some of your questions.
wants to ask a question? Um, what would you recommend as some first steps to getting involved in like whether it's local politics or state politics or just politics in general? Um, so really volunteering for like a campaign is always a super easy, great first step. You could get involved in a political club. You know, they have student clubs like College Democrats, College Republicans. They used to have College Libertarians. I don't know if they're still around. Um, I could tell you some stories. Uh, we, we hooked arms with the College Democrats and fought against BYUSA for a variety of reasons. It was a lot of fun. Um, but, uh, but get involved in clubs. In Utah, if you're a registered Utah voter, you can go to the caucus meetings in March, in mid-March on a Tuesday. I forget the exact date. I should know this. Um, the various political parties have these caucus meetings for each voting precinct where you can get elected as a delegate to the conventions for those parties. And that's also a great way to get involved. So the, we're kind of in the middle of some extraordinary times. And I, I'm curious about, with the 2020 election um, and some members of the Republican Party, they're continuing efforts to discredit mm. the results of that election. Oh, yeah. That has brought a lot of kind of government offices into the spotlight that like, have never been in the spotlight before. Yep. I'm curious from your understanding, like what what things do you think has changed about the way elections are run and kind of reported on, uh, if anything? Yeah, so you're bringing me a little PTSD because uh, our office is one of those that's been brought into the spotlight undeservingly. Um, so what you're talking about is that feature of American politics where Donald Trump broke America uh, I mean, he broke politics or campaigns or elections or something. I mean, it's it's mind-boggling to me. I spend way too much time in Telegram groups reading what people are saying about elections, and it's so far off base. But to your point, this is a PR problem. This is a public perception problem. This is a concerns from the public based on their perceptions and how, how do we fix it, and, and what do we do, and how do we change election reporting? Well, when we came into office, we committed to doing a lot more robust reporting, um, and we've continued to do that. We, we share data in formats that are easier to digest and a little more useful for politicos, but I've gone one step further and been like, you know what, we need to do some analysis, and um, so at the end of the day, uh, there's going to be a bill this legislative session in Utah that's going to change some of the ways that we administer elections to address some of these concerns, even though personally up from the inside, these aren't real problems. It's really more of a perception issue and a public faith and confidence issue. Um, so yeah, we've got to get better in that sense. I, I do get excited by data. So I've been pushing like the state office to share more macro data about voters because a lot of the concern about voter fraud has to rest on the idea that there are people who shouldn't be registered who are registered, which is not true in Utah. And I could debate you for hours about how it's not the case, but sharing data helps to show that. You know, and I can show you all kinds of cool data about how many voters we have at each age and gender. And I've looked at different demographics of our of our voters in Utah County, compared it to census data. I've been like a telegram warrior uh, doing, you know, hand to hand data combat with some of these national people, um, kind of calling them on the carpet for their really shoddy data work, by the way. Um, but yeah, it's a great point. We've got to change. The reality is, Nothing is systematically changing nationally or locally per se. To your point, each and in every office just has to kind of respond and react the best way they can. You would think it, it would get e easier with technology, and hopefully it will. Um, Utah's, for example, going to migrate to a new voter registration system, which will make reporting a lot easier and you know data sharing a lot easier and that kind of thing. Good, good question. Transparency is key to building public faith and confidence. Let's do two. Let's do two more questions. What was the transition like for you from law school to a career in, in politics? Or how did that look, that transition for you? Yeah, I mean, for me in particular, it was seamless because I was working full time. So it was like, you know, take Gene Cernan around Houston and then go to Civ Pro. So, you know, for me, it was very seamless because I wasn't a full time student and then a full time employee. Um, so that was helpful. Um, but I can see challenges in a transition from being a student to being an employee. And uh, 
I, most of the people I've observed doing that do it pretty well. Um, you know, one little side tip, have good resumes, please. Uh, I've had so many applicants for jobs in our office. It's none of you. It's not necessarily political science at BYU, but I've had BYU resume and UVU resume, and I'm like, this resume from BYU students sucks, and this UVU resume is awesome. So I don't know if they have like a special clinic or something, but like do some work on your resume. Have a good resume, because I'm always like, tear, like always sad to see BYU student resumes get beat by other resumes. Just, just in formatting and the way they read. Substantively, they're far better. <laughs> <laughs> any other, any last question anyone want to ask? No? Actually, just with their resumes. Oh. With their resumes, I'm curious. Um, like when you first spot a resume and you say, this is a good resume and this is a bad one, like what is it in the formatting that throws you off? Personally, I just like really pretty clean. Um, I like um, pithy. I like, um, I'm more of a technical person, so I, I like some bullets or, or things like that. I've seen these like weird resumes that are like way too artsy. That's certainly not the style in government or probably in business, maybe like in marketing or tech, I don't, I don't know. And then um, just, uh, I mean, I've just seen goofy stuff, like just clearly like the person didn't, didn't really like even read an article about how to write a good resume or didn't even use a template or didn't even have like a friend or family member look it over, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm.